So we flipped a coin. Stuart either won or lost, but he's going first. So let me talk to you just briefly about Stuart. Stuart Pym received his PhD in biology from the University of New Mexico, go Lobos. And since 2002, he's been the Doris Duke Professor of Conservation Ecology at Duke University, go Blue Devils, in Durham, North Carolina. Among many honors Dr. Pym has received, the Edward T. Leroux Memorial Award from the Society for Conservation Biology, an honor for leaders who translate principles of conservation biology into real world conservation. And the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences awarded him the A.H. Heineken Prize for Environmental Sciences for Research on Species Extinction and Conservation. And since 2004, he's been a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The 2010 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement is being awarded to him in recognition of his contributions to conservation science and the application of theory and technology to conservation biology. He's being honored for his work to delineate the structures of ecological food webs, to examine the consequences of losses in species diversity, and to develop theory and empirical analysis to address the conservation of endangered species. Dr. Pym's nomination for the Tyler Prize was initiated by E.O. Wilson, an emeritus Harvard University professor and himself a Tyler laureate. And, we, and when E.O. talks, it's good to pay attention. The nomination was supported by several notable names in conservation, among them Thomas E. Lovejoy, former president of the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment, and currently the center's biodiversity chair. In a letter of support for the nomination, Lovejoy said of Dr. Pym, he is clearly one of the leading conservation biologists in the world today, and someone who does not shy from going beyond to see that the science is implemented in conservation. He is, the prime, he is in the prime of a career that is truly exceptional. Ladies and gentlemen, 2010 Tyler Prize Laureate, Stuart Pym. Obviously, I am thrilled to be here. I have thanked the committee already. Let me thank them again. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, but it's also an honor for the field of conservation science. When I first went to Hawaii in the late uh, 1970s and saw species that are now extinct, saw others that are hanging on by their fingernails, we had no name for this field. I went to a meeting in Michigan. There are reasons to go to Michigan. <laughs> and um, at the School of Natural Resources, um, we had a meeting and we came out of it and said, we're going to do this thing called conservation biology. And we're going to found a journal and we're going to found a society and we're going to find a discipline. And that was 25 years ago or thereabouts. This is a very new field. And so I am thrilled that the committee for the Tyler Prize has not only honored me, but honored the field of conservation science. I want to talk about a number of things. But I don't want to talk about most of what I usually talk about because it's unrelentingly depressing and people go away you know, and throw themselves off tall buildings, <laughs> cry in their beer, uh, and all sorts of other unsociable activities. So I'm going to get rid of the bad news first and talk about solutions. And I think one of the things that unites um, the two laureates this year is that both of us care about practical solutions. When you listen to Al Gore tell you that species are going extinct a hundred to a thousand times faster than they should be, I hope you wondered from where he got that. You now know. Not that he actually mentioned my name. <laughs> But species, nonetheless, um, species extinctions are irreversible. And as I shall show you, they are geographically concentrated. I shall talk about the fact that tropical deforestation is the main driver of terrestrial extinctions. And I'll talk about what it takes to stop extinctions. 
Now, as you've already seen, I have a faculty appointment in Africa, at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I spend a good chunk of my time worrying about much the same issues as Laurie Marker does. So I'm going to concentrate today on, on a different continent and a different set of problems. In a recent book, modestly titled The World According to Pym, A Scientist Audits the Earth, I got that title because I didn't have a good title for the book. I was walking um, along uh, um, uh, a Central Park uh, with Katinka Matson, my agent, and she said, you know, we don't have a title for your book. I think it's The World According to Pym. She paused and said, do you have a sufficient ego to handle a title like that? And I assured her that I did. <laughs> um, in The World According to Pym, I talk about the big numbers. Our human population, now at 7 billion. What we're doing to the oceans, what we're doing to the dry lands of the world, but also what we're doing to the forests, particularly moist tropical forests. And we are shrinking them rapidly. This is a map that you might not fully appreciate unless we can have the lights down a little bit more. Um, it is not the map that you see when uh, you look at um, Secretary of State Clinton do briefings at the State Department. I think you can see the, the outline of the continents. And you can see that this map is a deeply challenging map politically. You notice that the United States is relatively small, uh, Greenland looks really tiny, and Africa looks huge, and you know, South America looks huge. This is a map that it is hard for Americans to appreciate, not because we have grown up with that school map of Mercator where we look big, because this is a map based on a soccer ball. Soccer is a game that everybody in the world plays, but we do not. And this year in South Africa, there's going to be an international match of soccer. And it might just get onto the American news. Now, for those of you who are not soccer challenged, I want you to think about what a soccer ball is. What is the shape of a soccer ball? Do not tell me it is round. We have some people who understand soccer. Thank you. It's a mixture of pentagons and hexagons. Imagine mapping the world onto a soccer ball and then getting a pair of scissors and cutting the soccer ball and laying it flat. And if you do that, you get what is technically called the Buckminster Fuller projection. And this totally radical view of the world has the great advantage that it does show you how relatively large different pieces of it. Africa, um, Governor Palin, is not one country but many, and it is three times the size of the United States. That is my contribution to, uh, to the American Tea Party. <laughs> when you look at that, you notice that there's a lot of green, but there's a lot of red. The green is where forest remains, and the red is where forest has disappeared, most of it within 50 years. So tropical deforestation is a major change. That deforestation is not only the principal driver of extinction, it also contributes 15% of the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year. That's more carbon emissions from all the cars and trucks, not only in the United States, it's more carbon emissions than all the cars and trucks in the entire world. Tropical deforestation is a very big piece of our global climate problem. The problem, as far as species extinctions are concerned, is that tropical forests are where the wild things are. It's where the greatest number of species are to be found. 
Um, this is that map showing the number of species of amphibians. You can see what a profoundly disturbing map this is. It just doesn't look right, does it? I grew up in Britain, which has a vast total of three species of amphibians. You can go to parts of Ecuador and find 130. It's fairly clear that where the forests are are where there are species of amphibians. If you look at what's happening to deforestation in the New World, you'll see that in addition to losses in the Northern Andes and the Caribbean and parts of, parts of Mexico, there's been a huge amount of deforestation in that other rainforest of Brazil, what we call the Atlantic Coast Forest of Brazil, the southeastern part of the continent. It's going to be the center of much of my talk. If you look at biodiversity, we know that there are very few species, in this case, of birds in Canada. We Americans have trouble with Canada. We can never remember the name of the prime minister. They have strange habits, like having universal health care and counting all the votes in a general election. Um, <laughs> but we are not to worry about Canada, because when it comes to biodiversity, they are at the bottom of the American League. Things get exciting when you start speaking Spanish, and get really exciting when you start speaking Portuguese. But what's the map on the right? The map on the right shows half of all the species of birds. But it's half of all species of birds arranged in terms of their geographical range. Imagine that we have an audience that contains some height-challenged people over here and the Duke basketball team by the door. And we line them up in terms of their height. And somewhere in the middle of the room, there is the 50th percentile. So that half the people are smaller, half the people are larger. Now let's do that with geographical ranges. So we have things with small ranges over here, large ranges over here. The map on the right is where the half of all species with small geographical ranges are to be found. And they are found in odd places. They are found in the Sierra Madres of Mexico. They are found in the Northern Andes. They are found in this coastal strip of forest right here. They're found um, in the Guyanas. These are the places where Mother Nature has put her eggs in a relatively small number of baskets. Species with small ranges are more vulnerable to extinction. It's easier to drive a species to extinction if it has a small range than it has a large one. Pattern of mammals, much the same. There's a lot of mammals in South America, but the places where mammals with small ranges are concentrated are in a few idiosyncratic places. Where species with small ranges collide with lots of habitat destruction, lots of deforestation. If you compare those two maps at the top and imagine slamming them to together, where the red of deforestation meets the, the concentration of species with small ranges, you find that where species are going extinct in the greatest numbers are a relatively few places. And in the Americas, it's this coastal strip of forest. So if we're going to save biological diversity, we better get on that aeroplane uh, to Rio de Janeiro, the one that Dr. Marker uh, came in on last night because they weren't able to 
come in via Europe because of some Icelandic volcano that was venting its wrath against the British Isles. The British, you may recall, have been quite unpleasant to the Icelanders over some, some money that they owe. And it's only a matter of time before somebody tells you it's a conspiracy. You heard it here first. <laughs> so who works in these areas? Um, I am unimpressed with much of how conservation is funded. I have to tell you that we have, along with the World Bank, a colleague at the World Bank, we've actually looked at how the World Bank funds conservation, and they don't do a bad job. But the World Wildlife Fund doesn't work in conservation in coastal Brazil. Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy have very small presences there. So if we're going to save species from extinction, this isn't something as scientists, this isn't something as activists, that we can simply let the big conservation groups do. I call them the bingos for big NGOs. Um, biodiversity is too important to leave to the bingos. And what I want to talk about are three things. I'm going to talk about the success of, of local initiatives. I'm going to talk about the importance of indigenous groups and how they protect the forest. And I'm going to talk about how Norway is saving the world. And since Norway is saving the world, I think this is going to appeal, I hope, to your patriotism so that you will rise up uh, and think, well, we as Americans ought to be saving the world too. If you map out where species of birds are found, this is what coastal Brazil looks like. Endemic birds are those birds found only in this area. These are places where there are a lot of species with small geographical ranges. You know, nature's eggs, the ones that are most vulnerable. And we can do this for birds because the world is full of millions, probably tens of millions of people who are passionate about identifying birds. There are nowhere near so many people who express such passion for nematodes. <laughs> this remarkable graphic done by my uh, colleague, um, Dr. Clinton Jenkins, is a map that's about um, 150 miles east-west the big black area, the embayment, is Guanabara Bay. The city of Rio de Janeiro is off to the left. This is looking north. Everywhere that has forest is color-coded. If it's gray, it means the forest has been cleared. And then if there is forest, it's color-coded by how many species are found there. It's a fancy piece of GIS. It's predicted species ranges draped over an elevation map, um, selected to show where the greatest number of threatened birds are indeed in all of the Americas. And you can see that at the eastern end of this image, at the right-hand end of the image, there are some red areas. There are some areas of isolated patches of forest which contain very large numbers of species threatened with extinction. What's going to happen to them? Well, for more than a decade, my research group has been working with Dr. Tom Lovejoy, who was a 2001 Tyler Prize recipient, along with Jared Diamond, who is another very close collaborator. And Tom, 30 years ago, set up a remarkable experiment. In an area just north of Manaus in the Amazon, the forest was being cleared for cattle pastures. The forest shows up in this image as a, as a continuous cover of dark green. The cattle pastures are variously light green if they have grass on them, or reddish if they have just open soil. And you can see within those open cattle pastures are little squares. Those are experiments of one 
10 and 100 hectares. And this experiment had the following kind of idea, that before deforestation, you could count the number of species present, and then over time, you could look at how fast those forest fragments would lose species. And so you could come up with some sort of an estimate of how long it would take a little patch of forest to lose its species, or perhaps lose half of its species, a sort of a half-life. That measure gives us a way to set a time limit on conservation action. How much time do we have before species are lost? I promise you that this is the most complicated slide that I have. It combines work that we've done in Brazil with work that we've done in Kakamega in Kenya. But the answer is, the bigger the fragment of forest, the bigger this forest island, the faster we will lose species. Sorry, the bigger the fragment, the slower we will lose species. The smaller the fragment, the faster we'll lose species. And unless you have a fragment of about a kilometer square, 100 hectares, you're going to lose species within a few years, within less than a decade. So if conservation is going to be effective, we need big fragments. And frankly, we need to get rid of fragments. Fragments are not a good idea. So if we're going to effect practical conservation in this area of eastern Brazil, we better connect those fragments to other patches of forest. And here is what it looks like on the ground. There's a fragment of forest on the right, forest on the left. We need to connect those two patches of forest. And the reason is not just the birds, it's not just the orchids, it's not just the butterflies. It turns out that that fragment is home to a particularly charismatic monkey called the golden lion tamarind. And what golden lion tamarinds want to do on a Saturday night is probably not unlike what most of the young people here in the audience, perhaps not so young people in the audience, want to do on a Saturday night, which is to find somebody of the opposite sex so that in time they can go forth and multiply. And if you live in a tiny fragment, life is no fun. So we want to connect these populations so that they are not isolated. I run a small conservation organization called SavingSpecies.org. It has as its uh, governing body uh, Peter Raven and Tom Lovejoy, uh, Norman Myers, Pat Wright. And we act as a Zagat's guide to conservation action, looking at the conservation projects done by small local groups. In this case, working with the IUCN Netherlands, we raise the money for Sociaso Micoli and Dorado, the Golden Lion Tamarind Association, to buy that land. And there are a bunch of Brazilian school children planting trees so that in time those Golden Lion Tamarinds over here can go and meet the Golden Lion Tamarinds over there and be happy. I want to talk about another story. In the very far north of Brazil, there are a group of indigenous groups that um, live in an area called the Reserva Indigena Raposa Serra do Sol. This is way, way north in Brazil. Uh, most of the time we're not sure, unless we look at our GPS, whether we're in Brazil or Guyana or Venezuela. These Indians were under threat from rice growers from the outside. The rice growers said, we understand you own the land around your village, but you don't own the forest. Prove to us that you own the forest. And these indigenous groups did prove that they owned all of the forest, so that the rice growers were eventually evicted in a historic landmark decision in Brazil um, that, that gave considerable rights to indigenous people. 
How did these indigenous groups become quite literally masters of all they surveyed? Well, living in communities that have not much more by way of technology than a machete, you will notice that these wonderful young men and women are holding, all holding something up in their hand. It's a GPS. And my graduate student, that's this blonde chap at the back, working with the, the lay Catholic mission, this is one of their lay preachers. Um, we trained them how to use a GPS. And so that when they went hunting and fishing and collecting medicinal plants, they could work out where they went. And we could come back and collect that information and we could mark it on our satellite imagery. And they literally became masters of all they surveyed. It became their land and those who would take it from them were evicted. Do protected areas work? Interestingly, the answer is yes. Many people think that if you protect areas, you might have paper parks, papers, parks that only work on paper. But it's not true. If we look at this graph at the top, we are taking a transect from inside a reserve to outside of the reserve, and we're looking at the forest cover. And what you find is in places like the Amazon, if you set up a national park, there's forest inside and there's forest outside. That's because the parks are so remote that it doesn't matter where you put them, the land will still be protected. Parks work um, de facto by their isolation. But if you look at areas where there are more people, parks still work to maintain forest cover. The graph on the right shows us forest cover inside a reserve and outside a reserve. Reserves work de jure too that people actually obey the boundaries of national parks to a large extent. So if we set up parks that are going to work, if you look at this map, it's an area about the size of half the continental United States. It's about 5 million square kilometers. The red are all the places that fires occur. We measure fires every night from satellite images flying over Brazil. The dark areas are protected areas. They're mostly indigenous reserves. And you can see that indigenous reserves are not where fires are. Indigenous reserves work to keep out the people who would burn the forest. That's where destruction is. It's essentially where the fires are. So if we set up protected areas, we know that they work. And we know that indigenous people who have rights to their own land, by and large, want to contain the forest, preserve the forest, and, and preserve their traditional way of life. This image here, which is about a thousand miles across the huge swath of the Amazon, is a satellite image taken on the 15th of August, 1999. It was one of the worst fire days Brazil has ever had. I flew over that area on that particular day. And these smudgy brown things, these white, these white areas are clouds. But all that brown muck are smoke plumes. Huge amounts of the Amazon goes up in smoke. And when you fly across the Amazon in August, um, you often can't see the ground because of the smoke. And some of these smoke plumes tower 40,000 feet up into the atmosphere. They're huge. And they go downwind, those smoke plumes above my finger, go downwind several hundred miles. These are huge fires. In the last year, Brazil has reduced its deforestation by two thirds. I got the opportunity through National Geographic, for whom I blog, please read my blogs on National Geographic, 
got my opportunity to interview the Brazilian Environment Minister, Carlos Mink. The top picture is areas um, where there were fires in 2008, 2009. You know, the darker the red, the more the, more the deforestation. You can see that to, to the forest year that ended in 2009, Brazil reduced its deforestation massively. I asked Minister Mink, how did they do it? He had two answers. The first was good science. Brazil has a very credible, very competent space agency that monitors deforestation. So they know where forests have been cut. And better enforcement. Much of the logging that takes place in the Amazon is, is illegal. And with a billion dollar promise from Norway through a program called RED, Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. And Norway has had the resources to massively slow its deforestation. At Copenhagen, um, the United States promised a billion dollars to aid programs like this. It's appropriations time on the Hill. I was there last week. We have a climate bill that is being developed. It's important for us to keep that promise at Copenhagen, to make sure that we pay a billion dollars. It's the cheapest way of offsetting carbon emissions. It's transparent. And we know from these studies that it's effective. What of the future? As I said before, a large component of greenhouse gas emissions is tropical deforestation. It's also the single biggest contributor to species loss. A hectare of forest contains about 150 tons of carbon. If you burn that forest, it will go into the atmosphere. And burning tropical forests puts out more than a billion tons of carbon every year. Begin to sound like Carl Sagan, you know, billions and billions of tons. <laughs> Equally, over the last 50 years, we have cleared 7 million square kilometers of tropical forest. 2 million of it has gone to crops. I understand that cropland is valuable. But 5 million has gone to wretched cattle pasture, where, as in the photograph at the top, that poor bloody cow is starving to death. This is really wretched land. And the project I talked to you about in Brazil through my organization, Saving Species, seeks to provide examples of how we can buy degraded cattle pasture, and in doing so, reforest it and soak up the carbon. If we could do that over the 5 million square kilometers of bad, degraded land, we would be soaking up huge quantities of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. In other words, saving species and saving the climate go hand in hand. We can save species. We can do that by empowering local conservation groups. We can do that by empowering indigenous groups so that they have control over their future. And we can pay for the services that Mother Nature provides. It just so happens I have my banker in the audience. Roger, please hold your hand up. Thank you. Uh, Roger, um, who works for me at Saving Species and manages the PIM Group, which is our website, accepts all major currencies, the credit cards, keys to expensive cars, you know, and all the other kinds of tradable currencies. So I'm sure Laurie is going to be telling you momentarily about how you can support her, but I can have a commercial too. Thank you very much. <laughs>